Listen, my wife has instructed me as I do with all my speeches for those who already know. I have to let everyone know that uh, unfortunately I have Tourette syndrome. <laughs> there it is. It's a neurochemical disorder uh, causing me to make sounds I can't control and facial tics I can't control. I've had it since age five, <laughs> but I only have the moderate kind. The worst kind uh, is where people actually curse for no reason and make f violent physical movements. But every time I curse, it's for a damn good reason. <laughs> and I only have violent physical movements when I'm dancing. And my, all my black friends appreciate it and like it. Uh, there must be nobody on the streets of New York City tonight it seems all of New York City is in this room. <laughs> this is the largest turnout in ZOA history that I am aware of. We turned hundreds of people away. <laughs> There's about 1,100 people in this room. <laughs> I'm proud and I'm privileged to welcome all of you, devoted and committed Zionists, whose love of Israel and the Jewish people is inspiring. <laughs> I believe that if there were Jews like you and Christian Zionists like you in this room around in the 30s and 40s, world history would have been different and Jewish history would have been different. <laughs> but we've learned some lessons from that awful time. Never again dare we be the Jews of silence. Never again. <laughs> Certainly we're not at the ZOA. Only two weeks ago, the Jerusalem Post said the ZOA <laughs> is a rare and courageous voice among Jewish organizations telling the truth about the ongoing Arab war against Israel, about President Obama's actions, <laughs> and about the fact that Mahmoud Abbas is nothing less than a dictator terrorist. No other Jewish organization <laughs> will publicly tell you that. <laughs> we at ZOA are frequently called right-wing as Jerry Seinfeld would say, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> We're called right wing because we said 21 years ago, Oslo would lead to disaster, not to peace. We said many years ago, yes, <laughs> the Gaza withdrawal would lead to Hamas controlling and missiles would come flying. We said 21 years ago, <laughs> Yasser Arafat is a terrorist, not a peacemaker. Mahmoud Abbas is a terrorist, not a peacemaker. <laughs> ZOA was and is not right wing. We are simply right. <laughs> and remember and use this line, truth is not a political position. Truth is not a political position. <laughs> we all watched and felt great misery and pain the last several weeks over the pure evil of this Islamic Arab jihadist Jew hatred that is relentlessly pursuing nothing less than Israel's destruction. <laughs> this evil hatred took the lives of so many precious and beautiful Jews, including babies and women, and a heroic Druze Israeli policeman. I would like to ask, just for a moment of silence, of these precious souls that we lost in the last few weeks to these terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> and when they're killing Jews, they scream, Allah, Allah, Akbar, God is great. What are they trying to say, God is great? Is God great because they're asking these Muslims to kill innocent civilians? <laughs> Where are the imams screaming against people who are screaming, God is great, when they're murdering innocent people? <laughs> and of course, we expected that even though the Palestinian authorities, Holocaust denying, terrorist dictator, Mahmoud Abbas was forced by the U.S. to offer a phony condemnation. Right after that condemnation, he condemned Israel's incursions and provocations against the Al-Aqsa Mosque and accused Israel of wanting to destroy that mosque. In previous days, Abbas praised an attempted Jew killer as a martyr who rose to heaven while defending Palestinian rights. And they called the Israeli police who killed this terrorist, he called the police <laughs> terrorists. 
Ladies and gentlemen, don't ever think that these evil Arab killers are extremists and loners <laughs> in their Palestinian society. After their murders, thousands of Palestinian Arabs literally danced in the streets, handed out sweets to everyone, <laughs> while displaying large posters of the killers as heroes, <laughs> waving axes and knives and guns. <laughs> the Palestinian government, its websites, and thousands of other Arab social media were proclaiming joy <laughs> at what these heroes have done. So they are not, in their Palestinian Arab society, extremists or on the fringes of their society as Charlie Manson is in ours. They, these killers, are part of the mainstream, inspired by and lauded by their leaders, by their official media, and by the Palestinian people. We should never forget that. These are mainstream, these killers and these awful horrors. <laughs> Remember, the PA regularly holds parades and ceremonies glorifying deceased Jew killers. They name parks and streets and schools and sports teams after them. They display large posters honoring them in their schools and universities. <laughs> the Palestinian Authority pays pensions to the families of these killers. The more Jews they kill, the larger their pension. Can you believe this? And the world says nothing. And the U.S. says nothing. And a few months ago, Fatah merged with Hamas, a Nazi-like terrorist group whose charter calls for the murder of every Jew. And despite this horror, the United States said nothing. The world said nothing. This was a diplomatic Kristallnacht when the world ignored this merger with a Nazi group and said nothing. Not only that, <laughs> we U.S. taxpayers fork over $500 million a year to this terrorist regime. <laughs> During the Hamas war, we sent $47 million, million more to Hamas during the war. The war. <laughs> what message does this send? <laughs> Edmund Burke said, all that is necessary for evil is to triumph, to triumph is for good people to do nothing. <laughs> we not only say and do nothing, we pay for these people worse than doing nothing. We encourage them, we fund them. This funding must stop. <laughs> and almost as painful as seeing the barbaric slaughter of Jews was the frightening and disgraceful response by many world leaders <laughs> who only condemned Israel for building homes in areas that would never be given away no matter what, and condemned Israel for, for uh, excessive use of force, <laughs> and even talked about sanctions. <laughs> and our own president, Barack Hussein Obama, <laughs> showed no emotion and actually proclaimed a moral equivalence between Israel and the Palestinians by saying too many Israelis have died and too many Palestinian Arabs have died. He shamelessly equated the intentional barbaric murder of Jews <laughs> with Hamas Arabs who died in a war that Hamas started and refused to stop for seven weeks. <laughs> who are the terrorists, Mr. Obama? Who is being terrorist, terrorized? Shame on you, Mr. Obama, for these outrageous words of moral equivalence. <laughs> and he even said that most Palestinians want peace. Really? He said that this past week. <laughs> he wants peace when the, when the emblem of the Passion Authority is all of Israel with an Arab cafe over it, a picture of Arafat and the Kalishnikov rifle. This is P Mahmoud Abbas's official emblem that he commissioned. And he doesn't say a word about it. I've given this to President Obama personally, and he just ignored it and told an aide to just put it in his pocket. <laughs> in their own polls, 60% of the Palestinians reject accepting Israel. Most Palestinians don't want peace. Most Palestinians want to see the destruction of Israel. <laughs> so there's been no change in U.S. policy despite the horrors of the last week. <laughs> the message that we are sending to the Palestinians is clear. 
No matter how great the outrage that the Palestinians perpetrate, the world and the U.S. will demand no price. <laughs> imagine, imagine <laughs> if the United States would have publicly said this week, we extend our condolences to the people of Israel, <laughs> and we are now firmly convinced that the peace process cannot continue under such circumstances. We will support Israel using any military action against you, and we will stop giving you one cent until this sort of behavior stops. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, America's attitude and Europeans' attitude toward Israel, I'm sorry to say, is very similar to the world's attitude toward Czechoslovakia in 1938. <laughs> and of course, Obama has stopped Israel from using military action He's on the verge of making a terrible deal with Iran. <laughs> the truth is Iran must be stopped from obtaining nuclear weapons. It is our duty of the whole world. The memory of the Holocaust goes beyond holding memorial services. It is not merely a historical recollection. The memory of the Holocaust obligates us to apply the lessons of the past to ensure our future. <laughs> <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas this week said Muslims will never accept Israel's claim that Jerusalem belongs to them. He said it belongs to us, the, the Muslims. <laughs> this is a propaganda lie. Jerusalem is not holy to Muslims. It doesn't belong to them. <laughs> Jerusalem was the capital of Israel under King David 3,000 years ago. It was the, never the capital of any other nation except Israel. When the Arabs conquered Palestine in 716, they made Ramla their capital, not <laughs> Jerusalem. And you know, notice it's called the Temple Mount, not the Mosque Mount. It's named after our Jewish temple. <laughs> they always say it's the third holiest place. They never say the Temple Mount is the number one most important, most holiest place to Jewish people. <laughs> the majority of people living in Jerusalem since 1840 was Jews, not Muslims, since 1840. <laughs> Our Jewish holy books mention Jerusalem 700 times. The Koran never mentions it. <laughs> Let me tell you something interesting. When the Koran <laughs> claims Muhammad rose <laughs> from the farthest place to heaven, <laughs> they claim this is Jerusalem. Well, it doesn't say Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a famous city. And yet they didn't say Jerusalem. They could have said Jerusalem. And they say the farthest place. Yet in the Koran, they refer to Palestine repeatedly as the closest place, as the nearest place. That means it's highly unlikely that Muhammad went to heaven from Jerusalem. It was someplace much further away than Jerusalem. Let's not accept their propaganda lies. <laughs> From 48 to 67, when the Arabs controlled Eastern Jerusalem, <laughs> they allowed it to become a slum. They destroyed 58 synagogues. Not a single Arab leader visited Jerusalem, even though it's so damn holy to them. There, I cursed for a damn good reason. <laughs> <laughs> they also constantly say, we have to end the occupation. Well, is there really an occupation? Israel's given away all of Gaza, 42% <laughs> of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, where 98% of the Palestinians live. <laughs> the Palestinians have their own parliament, own schools, textbooks, newspapers, radio stations, TV and businesses. <laughs> yes, Israeli military troops are there because there are terror cells constantly evolving to kill Jews. <laughs> there are checkpoints because there's continuous terror threats. No terror threats, no checkpoints. No terror threats, no IDF in Judea and Samaria. <laughs> we, in America, we have checkpoints at all of our airports. Yes, they're checkpoints. No terrorism threatened by Arabs. We would not have checkpoints at our airports. But they'll stay there as long as the Muslims are threatening terrorism against the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Only after Israeli troops left Gaza could they build terror tunnels and, and import 10,000 missiles. We dare not allow the same to happen to Judea and Samaria. God forbid we allow full sovereignty in Judea and Samaria so there can be terror tunnels there and have 20 Gazas in Judea and Samaria. God forbid we allow this. And also, are the settlements illegal? 
the British legally controlled Palestine, a region from 1917 to 1948. They gave 80% of Palestine away to Jordan in 1922. <laughs> in 1948, they offered half of the rest of Palestine to the Arabs, half to the Jews. The Arabs invaded Israel. They said no. <laughs> Jordan illegally seized Judea and Samaria in the 48 war. Only two states recognized it. This is unallocated land under international law. <laughs> in the 67 Arab war against Israel, Israel begged King Hussein not to enter it. He, was, he decided to enter it, and that's why Israel captured it. <laughs> After the war, Israel offered all of the land back for peace, and the Arabs said, absolutely not. They refused peace. In 1988, King Hussein <laughs> publicly relinquished his claims to Judea and Samaria. He relinquished them. Uh, and Article 24 of the PLO Covenant openly says the PLO doesn't exercise any sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. They have no legal moral, historical, religious rights there. Every Jew who lives there, every home that's built in Judea and Samaria is legal and proper and moral. <laughs> and there's not been a single new settlement built since 93. Any new building has been within the boundaries of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria that were established in 1993. There's been no, no new ones whatsoever. <laughs> and finally, people say just give them a state. We all know, first of all, it'll be an Iran Hamas terror state. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. The Palestinian Arabs do not want a state if it means accepting Israel. Let me prove it to you. In 1937, the Peel Commission offered the Palestinian Arabs a state on 95% of Palestine. They said no because it meant accepting Israel on 5% of it. In 1948, they offered them a state, they said no. In 2000, Ehud Barak offered them a state in parts of Jerusalem, they said no. In 2008, Ehud Olmer offered them a state on 97% of Judea and Samaria and half of Jerusalem, and Ehud Olmer told me Abbas never even got back to him. <laughs> Last month, Egypt offered them a state on 618 square miles in the Sinai next to Gaza, and Abbas said, that's illogical. We won't have it. <laughs> From 48 to 67, when they controlled all the lands they want for a state, they never established such a state. The Palestinian Authority has no interest in the state if it means accepting Israel. That's why nothing has worked. Their goal is simple. <laughs> we must destroy the Jewish state of Israel no matter how long it takes. That's why, God forbid, we should give them additional power to... to, uh, to be able to fulfill this odious dream of theirs by giving the Palestinians any more sovereignty and any more concessions that we've already given them. Just remember, <laughs> Syria, Iran, and North Korea, they all have states. Are they lovely? They're monstrous. Sovereignty only strengthens the underlying power of the people who live there to promote whatever agenda <laughs> they want. President Obama asked Abbas three months ago, two months ago, will you accept a state if Israel gives you, goes back to the 67 lines. <laughs> but he said, you have to sign a clause, no further claims. Abbas said to him, I won't sign a clause that says no further claims, even if you go to the 67 lines, even if I get half of Jerusalem. <laughs> I won't stop fighting for millions of so-called refugees to live there, and I will never say Israel is a Jewish state. So he made it crystal clear what the goal is. That's why it's insane. It is foolish. <laughs> it is nonsense. It is anti-Israel for anyone to say, let's give these Palestinian Arab terrorists an Iran Hamas state. God forbid we ever do that. <laughs> I'll end by saying we must stop the appeasement, no more unilateral concessions. We must stop the $500 million in aid, especially as long as they have an agreement and a merger with Hamas. We must demand they change their textbooks that promote hatred and violence. We must move our embassy to Jerusalem. <laughs> we must set up a commission on incitement, define it, and impose real consequences if they don't stop this incitement. <laughs> we must demand, of course, Hamas stop being part of the Palestinian Authority. We must demand that all the schools, streets, and sports teams that are named after Jew-killing terrorists, those names be ended. <laughs> and let me tell you something else. <laughs> We must demand of the Israeli government, don't destroy the homes of terrorists. Take the homes away. 
sell the homes, and give the money to the families who have been murdered by these terrorists. Let, <laughs> let the terrorists know that they will contribute to Zionism in Israel any time they harm a Jew. Let them know that they contribute to it. <laughs> and I will end by simply saying, <laughs> can we Jews alone be right when the whole world is saying we're wrong? Is it possible the whole world is against us? Can we alone be right? <laughs> well, the history of the Jewish people has been that we've been right so many times throughout history and the whole world's been wrong. <laughs> Most recently, the nu nuclear reactor, the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981, <laughs> Israel destroyed it, the whole world condemned Israel, including the United States. We were right, the whole world was wrong. <laughs> the whole world was polytheistic. We alone preached in uh, belief in one God. We preached that they arrest and the whole world mocked us as a lazy people. We were right, the whole world was wrong. They said we crucified a Jew, we denied it. <laughs> they insisted uh, that such a thing uh, must have happened, but of course it never happened. We were right, the whole world was wrong. <laughs> they said that we took children's blood to make matzah. <laughs> Ridiculous. They said we poisoned the wells of Europe during the Black Plague. The Crusades, the blood libels, the Talmud burnings, <laughs> the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions, the ghettos, the Mortara case in Italy, the Dreyfus trial, on and on and on. We Jews have been right throughout history, even when the whole world has been completely ridiculous and wrong, and they're wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> and I will quote from the book of Joshua. We must be strong, said Joshua, and we must not be afraid, for God is with us. Mm -hmm. Our holy Torah promises that we are an eternal people, never to be destroyed, and so it has been, and so it will continue to be. Mm -hmm. The cause of Israel is moral and just. We must act and speak out with courage. Truth and justice and God are on the side of Israel and the Jewish people. With your help, with the help and the strength and the will of the Israeli people, with the help of the Israel Defense Forces, with the help of Almighty God, New miracles that we cannot foresee will occur, and the people of Israel shall dwell in their holy land for eternity. We will prevail. Thank you so very much. Well, good evening, everybody. I, I feel like the last horse in the race here. The, uh, usually at times like this, it's appropriate to thank those individuals who helped make this award possible. I'd like to save those remarks till the end of these short minutes. Mort Klein called me a few months ago to ask if I would accept the Louis Brandeis Award. After I, after I said why, he explained why, and then I asked, do I have to do anything or say anything? He said, well, last year, the honoree said thank you and sat down. <laughs> but I think you should do more. So he, I said okay, and he gave me seven minutes and to stay on schedule, but he never told me I would be competing with Shmuley Bateach, <laughs> with Mort Klein, with Senator Ted Cruz, with Pastor Hagee, with Alan Dershowitz, Bernie Marcus, Sheldon Adelson, and the rest. Nevertheless, I thought tonight I'd speak for a few minutes about the man for whom this award is named after, Judge Louis Brandeis so that those too young, like my six grandchildren sitting at table 19, or, or those not old enough, like our students, like many here, would get some sense of this very special person that has meant so much, not only to our Jewish people, but as many other human beings, particularly in the United States of America. Justice Brandeis and I have two things in common. He was born on November 13th, and so was I. Believe it or not, he in 1856, and myself in 1937. He was, and I am, a Zionist. After those two similarities, it would be disingenuous to even think the two individuals are similar. Brandeis was a secular Jew from an immigrant family that was at least from an upper middle class environment. 
He was, some say, the best Harvard Law School ever had in terms of academic achievement, at least in Sen until Senator Cruz and Alan Dershowitz got there. He, with great difficulty from anti-Semites at his time, became the first Jewish Supreme Court Justice of the United States. As a justice, his works on human rights and justice for all people are renowned. He is often quoted, and you must remember this quote, I'm sure, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. That quote occurs in many speeches everywhere and in many opinions. These opinions are universal, but Justice Brandeis' major contribution was to the Jewish people. In my mind, his most important gift. The prescience of Brandeis was best understood in 1915 in a speech to the Conference of the Eastern Council of Reform Rabbis. I quote, almost 100 years ago, the suffering of the Jews to injustice continues for nearly 20 centuries. It is the greatest tragedy in human history. He went on to defend Zionism, quote, Zionism aims to give the foundation of Jewish nationality its full development. It is not just a movement to remove all Jews to Palestine. It is not a movement to compel anyone. It is a movement to give the Jews more, not less, freedom. It aims to enable the Jews to exercise the same rights recognized by practically every other people in the world. Zionism seeks to establish in Palestine for such Jews as choose to go and remain there, and for their descendants, a legally secured home where they may live together and lead a Jewish life, where they may expect ultimately to constitute a majority of the population and may look forward to what we should call home rule. For a people whose 3,000 years of civilization has produced a faith, a culture, an individuality which enable it to contribute largely in the future, as it has in the past, to the advance of civilization. And that is not a right merely, but a duty of the Jewish nationality to survive and develop. Zionists believe that not only in Palestine can Jewish life be fully protected from the forces of disintegration, that there alone can be the Jewish spirit reach its full and natural development, and that by securing for those Jews who wish to settle in Israel the opportunity to do so, not only those Jews, but all other Jews. Since the destruction of the temple 3,000 years ago, and I'm sorry, nearly 2,000 years ago, the longing for Palestine is ever present in every Jew. It was the hope of return to the land of his fathers that buoyed up the Jew amidst persecution and for the realization of which the devout ever prayed. Until a generation ago, meaning around 1900, this was a hope, merely a wish piously prayed for but not worked for. It was in fact the Zionist movement, its ideals, but it's also essentially practical. It seeks to realize that hope to make the dream of a Jewish life in a Jewish land comes true. Brandeis knew that a Jewish state in Palestine was required but would not let it get in the way of his patriotism for America. Let no American imagine, he said, that Zionism is inconsistent with patriotism. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. A man is a better citizen of the United States for being also a loyal citizen of his state, of his city, for his family, for his profession or trade, or being loyal to his college. Every Irish American who contributed towards advancing home rule was a better man and a better American for the sacrifice he made. Every American Jew 
who aids in advancing a Jewish settlement in Palestine, though he feels that neither he nor his descendants may never live there, will likewise be a better man and a better American for doing so. I could, <clears throat> I could spend too much time, so let me conclude with the Justice's statement on our duty, which is applicable today as it was in 1915, nearly 100 years ago. The duty, rest upon, the duty resting upon we Americans is especially insistent. We numbered in 1915 about three million, which is more than one-fifth or was one-fifth of the Jewish worldwide population, which is less 100 years from then. We are representative of all the Jews in the world composed of immigrants, of descendants of immigrants, coming from every other country or district. We include persons from every section of society and religious belief. We ourselves free from civil or political disabilities and are relatively prosperous. Our fellow Americans are infused with a high and generous spirit which ensures of our struggle to ennoble, liberate, and otherwise improve the condition of an important part of the human race and their innate manliness makes them sympathize particularly with our efforts of self-help. And a conflict between American interests or ambitions and Jewish aims is not and should not be conceivable. Our loyalty to America can never be questioned. Brandeis died on October 5, 1941. If he were alive today, he would be speaking again with much the same thoughts about clouds on the horizon. And our duty is, as Herzl said, if you wish it, it is no fable. His dreams of a Jewish homeland came true. But if he looked out at this audience, he would give a warning. It is not over. There are still dreams. That is our duty now to achieve. So with that, let me say my thank yous. Receiving this award is a deep and respected honor for me and my immediate family, all of whom are here tonight. An award I share with not only those that came before, but also with many in this room that have helped me along the way. I want to give special thanks to three men and two women. To Sheldon Adelson. A Zionist, first and foremost, for what he does for the cause of Israel and what he does for the Jewish people, and for the providing me the platform of recognition which has allowed me to fulfill my obligations more than business, but to the Jewish people. Thank you to Bernie Marcus, a Zionist. Who lent me to Sheldon. Who taught me how to invest energy and time in the causes that matter and has been a friend for 30 years. Thank you to Dr. Miriam Adelson, a true Zionist born in Israel, who whispered in my ear in February 2009, come to Las Vegas. You will have fun. We need you. And I came. And my life and that of my descendants at Table 19 have been changed forever. Thank you, Andrea, my spouse who for 53 years and six months has advised, <laughs> has advised, supported, cheered, cried, and loved, and whose contributions to whatever success I have achieved would never have happened without her.
Lastly, I'd like to thank a man who only one person in this room knew, besides me, my maternal grandfather. My maternal grandfather's name was Frank Goldberg. He immigrated to the United States from a shtetl in Russia near Odessa by the name of Slavitsky. I lived in the same apartment with him for the first 16 years of my life. He had no money. But whatever he had, he put in a little blue box or lent it to a family member or a friend in need. What I remember most is we used to listen to the radio together. The Lone Ranger, Gabriel Heater for news, and Jack Benny for laughs, although he didn't like Jack's wife very much. She was a shiksa, but you know. <laughs> it was Shabbos evening, November 29th, 1947. The sun had already set in a wintry Boston, and Frank, who was lovingly called Froyum by my grandmother, was sitting at the kitchen table when I came home from a friend's and the radio was on. It was not a familiar scene. He was staring intensely at the box, probably an RCA Victor, and it sounded like people saying yes, no, abstain. What is that, Pa? I said. He looked at me and he held up his hand and said, Sha, Lausanne still. He had a pad and a pencil, and he was marking it. I had no idea he was counting. Then all of a sudden, I hear some clapping on the radio. I looked across at him, and tears were flowing down his face. I never saw my grandfather cry. He couldn't talk. Finally, he wiped his eyes, took both my 10-year-old hands, and looked into my eyes and said, Boychik, in his heavy accent, we have a home. The United Nations voted to give us a Jewish homeland. I have never forgotten that scene to this day. Yes, I had three years of Hebrew school. Yes, I sat next to him as he was vice president of the Orthodox Show for years on Saturdays. Yes, I had carried my grandmother's sitter on the high holidays, and yes, I knew all the biblical stories and Israel's past and the patriarchs and the Passover. But never did I know at that time what that vote meant for my grandfather, or in fact, what it would mean to millions of Jews forever, and how vital that vote was to the survival of the Jewish people. Looking back now at the emotion of my grandfather and my own passion for the state of Israel, wherever he is now, he would be the proudest of anyone this evening. He knew, even without education, even then, what that vote meant. So this award really belongs to him, not to me. I dedicate this bust of Louis Brandeis to Frank Goldberg. A Jew, a Zionist, and my grandfather. Thank you. That's a real mensch. And now I'd like to introduce another mensch, Professor Alan Dershowitz. renowned Harvard Law professor. He's an author, he's an ardent Zionist, and he's going to present the Bob Schulman Award to an outstanding pro israel leg legislator, and that's Ted Cruz. Thank you so much. Wow, what a gathering. This is really unbelievable when I look out at this audience. Young people, people my age, all right, now get ready to boo. I'm here as a liberal Democrat Zionist. 
Brandeis was a liberal Democrat Zionist. I'm here in the spirit of unity and bipartisanship. Israel must always remain a bipartisan issue. It can never divide Republicans from Democrats, liberals from conservatives, Christians from Jews. We must all stand together. We know that if you put two Jews in a room, you're going to get three opinions. If you put two Israelis in a room, they're going to publish 11 newspapers, except if one of them is Israel Hayom. They're going to try to ban it somehow in Israel. And we're going to stop them from doing that, liberals and conservatives alike, because we believe in free speech. So when you put two Zionists in a room, you get 100 opinions. And here tonight, we have 100 opinions about the peace process, about Yehuda and Shomron, about Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, about how to deal with Iran. But we have one opinion when it comes to Israel's right to thrive as the nation state of the Jewish people. We have one opinion when it comes to Israel's right to defend itself against terrorism and tunnels and murders. We have one opinion. We have one opinion when it comes to Iran not being able to develop nuclear weapons or even be a threshold nuclear state. It's interesting because I listened to our brilliant president and I checked off and I said, I agree with about 80% of what he said, which is pretty high for any two Zionists. And I make what I like to call the 80% case whenever I defend Israel. I make the case in which there is consensus, on which all Zionists and all decent people and all American patriots agree. We can continue to disagree about the 20%. Obviously, we're not going to come to complete agreement about extremely controversial issues. The difference between this organization and, for example, now you can boo, J Street, is that if you went to a Dre Street event, there'd be two differences. Number one, they would be emphasizing the 20% to the exclusion of the 80%. They would be focusing only on issues that divide rather than issues that unite. There'd be one other difference. I would not be invited to speak to them. They call for an open tent, but they have closed their own tent to any centrist views, any pro-Israel views, any views represented by you in this room and even me here at the lectern. You know, to be anti-Israel in America today is to be anti-American. And if you look at who the radical, hardline, hard left, anti-Israel defamers are, the vast majority of them hate America. Norm Chomsky, Norman Finkelstein, you can name them. They hate America. To love America is to love Israel. Now, I grew up, as Louis Brandeis did, as a great American patriot. My grandmother, who came from Poland, used to take me to the Statue of Liberty on July 4th and make me sing not only the first stanza of the national anthem, as we heard it tonight by the wonderful, wonderful Chazan, but she made me sing the second stanza. Now, a lot of people that I tell the story to deny there's a second stanza, but this organization, in the spirit of patriotism, printed the second stanza. Open it up, you'll see in your books, and I know the words to it, because my patriotic grandmother used to make me sing it all the time. Now, we have different views. We have different views in this room, not only on Israel, but on social, economic, and political views. And that's a very healthy thing for a democracy. But what we have is unity. We have unity in support of Israel. We have unity among Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals. We have unity on this issue. I bet there's not a single person in this room, nor any thoughtful person in America who would disagree with the following statement. 
No country in the history of the world faced with threats comparable to those faced by Israel has ever had a better record on human rights, the rule of law, <laughs> protecting civilians who live in enemy countries even when they're used as human shields. You cannot disagree with that statement if you have any sense of history and any honest appraisal of where the world stands today. We who support Israel must express our deep gratitude, our deep appreciation, and yes, our admiration for those who stand up for the nation state of the Jewish people, even if we disagree with their other political, theological, or social views. We must stand together on the issue of Israel. And the corollary of that is we must express our disdain and our opposition to those who try to demonize Israel, even if we agree with them on some other social and political issues. Let me give you an example. I am active, you may, some of you may agree, some of you may, may disagree. I am active on the issues of gender equality and also on the issue of gay rights. But I am so adamantly opposed to many gay leaders who have stridently opposed Israel. This whole idea that you see on college campuses of pink washing, I don't know if you know that concept, but it's widespread. It was an op-ed in the New York Times. It was the dumbest op-ed ever published in the New York Times, and that's a low, low threshold. <laughs> but this article, written by gay, a gay activists and supported by many gay activists, took the position, yes, Israel is very positive toward gays. Yes, it has gays in the military. Yes, it has gays in all aspects of Israeli life. But the only reason it does it is to whitewash what it does to Palestinians, and they call it pinkwashing. And so my question to leaders of groups that I agree with on so many issues is why? Why don't you follow your principles when it comes to Israel? Israel has the strongest support for gay rights, for women's rights, for environmental rights. So many liberal causes are supported by Israel. So why do so many on the hard left demonize Israel? And we who are liberals must point our finger of accusation at our fellow liberals and fellow people on the left and say, shame on you, be principled. And it's in that spirit, in the spirit of support, in the spirit of unity, that I am proud to introduce my friend. I was going to say my former student, but the Talmud says there's no such thing as a former teacher. Once a teacher, always a teacher. I am so proud to support Senator Ted Cruz. Now, it would be an understatement. It would be an understatement to say that we do not agree on every issue currently in the news and currently that divides Democrats and Republicans. But boy, do we agree on Israel. And when Senator Cruz stood up at that meeting a few months ago of a group called In Defense of Christians, and he spoke to a group, and in that group, there were some Arabs who booed him, Christian Arabs who booed him when he talked about support of Israel. And he pointed a finger at them and said, if you can't stand up for Israel, I cannot stand with you. And he walked off that stage. And that was... That was one of the great moments in modern American history. And let me tell you, if President Kennedy were around writing his book on profiles and courage, that would be a chapter in profiles of courage. And he deserves all of our commendation and support. As we say, Yashir Koach, may you go from strength to strength. Now I want to do something cute. I want to read you from a recent entry in the congressional record, the most interesting piece of literature since C-SPAN. Okay, I'm gonna change a couple of words just to make my point, but here's what he says. 
He says, he and I, see who, see who we're writing about, but this could be me speaking. He and I became friends, ironically because we disagreed so much. In class, he would offer withering critiques of opinions offered by liberal justices, and I was often moved to disagree. Heated arguments followed, uh, which then Ted Cruz always seemed to relish. And then it goes on to say, although a man of the right, he did not shy away from disagreeing with his conservative colleagues when principle compelled it. A passionate advocate for free speech, he fearlessly took on the political correctness of campus speech codes. No conformist he. And there has been no fiercer advocate for Israel. His passion, his persuasiveness, his willingness to take on all comers have made him incompatible voice for the nation state of the Jewish people. Senator Cruz is an intellectual power horse who could have done anything in his life and he made the deliberate decision to enter public service. He chose to share his intelligence and pass it on. He chose to invest in the future of others instead of only himself. Now I have to tell you, that's what Senator Cruz wrote about me in the congressional record. Just changed the word liberal to conservative, teacher to student. So we have more in common than anyone would suspect. So it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce a man of principle, a man of high intelligence, a man of determination, and one of Israel's strongest supporters in the United States Senate, my friend, my student, Senator Ted Cruz. God bless the nation of Israel. And God bless the United States of America. Let me say to my friend, Alan Dershowitz, an incredible teacher, a man who will fiercely defend his principles, even when he's wrong. <laughs> a man who speaks from the heart. A simple word of warning. If you keep saying nice things about me, they're not going to let you back into the Harvard faculty lounge. <laughs> I am so grateful for your friendship and your passionate commitment to your principles. Let me also say to Mort Klein, what an incredible, powerful voice. You know, as Mort began his remarks tonight and he shared what he views as a limitation in his speech. I was reminded of the book of Exodus, describing Moses as short of tongue and speech. And yet Moses spoke up with a clarion voice and said, let my people go. Let me tell you, Mort Klein, has the heart of a lion and the voice of Moses. There are so many incredible people here tonight that are gathered to support the nation of Israel, to support ZOA, to support our country. There's my friend and fellow honoree, fellow Texan, Pastor John Hagee. Fellow honoree Michael Levin, what an incredible speech and remarks from the heart. 
There are titans of business, such as the man for whom this award is named, Dr. Bob Schulman. Thank you for your incredible leadership. <laughs> such as our MC tonight, Bernie Marcus, an incredible visionary in this country. and our friends, the incomparable Sheldon and Miriam Adelson. If there is a fight from which they run away, the world has yet to see what that one is. We're here at a time of incredible challenge. Just this past week, we saw the murder of five Jews, four rabbis and a police officer, and a synagogue in Jerusalem, the holy and eternal capital of the nation of Israel. We saw images that broke all of our hearts of prayer shawls covered in blood. And we saw the fruit of incitement as Hamas celebrated and Fatah justified that despicable act of terrorism. We also saw how the interests of Israel and the United States are intertwined. Of the five murdered last week, three of them were dual Israeli-American citizens. We have seen in recent months over and over again that phenomenon. Whether it was Naftali Frankel, one of the three teenagers kidnapped and murdered who was a dual Israeli-American citizen. Or Sean Carmelli, one of the first IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza operation, who was a dual Israeli-American citizen. Or Stephen Sotloff, the second journalist beheaded by ISIS, who was a dual Israeli-American citizen. Or Chaya Zisselbron, the little girl wantonly murdered by a Palestinian terrorist driving an automobile into a crowd, who was a dual Israeli-American citizen. These enemies are murdering Jews, whether Israeli or American, and they are the very same enemies. This is a time of enormous challenge and mourning, and yet, the same time today is the first day of the month of Kislev, the month of Hanukkah. A month of miracles, celebrating how the Maccabees, a small group of Jews, stood against the many seeking to drive them from Jerusalem, and the few defeated the many. The righteous defeated the unrighteous. If there is one principle that ZOA is dedicated to, it is that truth has power. There is no equivalence between the terrorist who carries out murder and the Israeli who defends himself or herself. The last two years I've served in the Senate, I've been privileged to travel to the nation of Israel three separate times. The threats to Israel right now have never been greater. And now is a time when we do not need leaders who simply speak empty words of support for Israel. We need leaders who will stand and act Now more than ever is a time 
to strengthen the unshakable friendship and alliance America has with the nation of Israel. In my time in the Senate, I have endeavored to strengthen that alliance through using a tripartite strategy. The first piece has focused on rifle shot accomplishments, things that could bring people together and get done. So for example, months ago when the nation of Iran named as their ambassador to the United Nations, Hamid Aboudalabi, a known terrorist who'd participated in holding Americans hostage in 1979 and 1980. It was intended to be, and it was in fact, a slap in the face to America. And yet people in Washington wrung their hands. They said, there's nothing we can do. I introduced legislation barring Aboudalabi from coming into the United States. That legislation received support from senators as widely varied as Lindsey Graham and Chuck Schumer. Indeed, Senator Schumer on the floor of the Senate was speaking in support of the legislation. I went up to him, I said, be careful, Chuck, lightning's gonna strike you. <laughs> that legislation passed the US Senate 100 to nothing. It passed the House of Representatives 435 to nothing. And then President Obama signed it into law. A Couple of weeks after that, he was speaking at one of these Washington dinners where politicians try to be funny. And he said, a couple of weeks ago, Ted Cruz introduced legislation that I signed into law. He said, here's a picture of the signing ceremony. He put up a picture of him, a picture of me, and the devil in hell freezing over. <laughs> but together, we were able to change the law so that known terrorists cannot live in Manhattan with diplomatic immunity. Yeah. A second rifle shot example after Three Israeli t teenagers were kidnapped and murdered by Palestinian terrorists. I introduced legislation in the U.S. Senate for the State Department to provide a $5 million reward for information leading to the capture of those terrorists. <laughs> Naftali Frankel, one of the three teenagers, was a U.S. citizen, and there's a long history and practice of State Department rewards for those who have murdered U.S. citizens abroad. That legislation was co-sponsored with New Jersey Democrat Bob Menendez. And it passed the U.S. Senate 100 to nothing. Thankfully, Israeli law enforcement captured the terrorists before the House was able to take up the bill. Another example is, is a resolution I've introduced with New York Democrat Kirsten Gillibrand <laughs> condemning Hamas's use of human shields as a human rights violation. That resolution has already passed the House of Representatives unanimously, and I am hopeful that it will very soon pass the Senate as well. And a fourth example of rifle shot efforts to make a positive influence strengthening the U.S.-Israel friendship and relationship we all remember some months ago when the administration banned flights into the nation of Israel. Within hours, I stood up and asked a very simple question. Did the Obama administration just launch an economic boycott on the nation of Israel? 
The FAA does not ban flights into Pakistan, into Yemen, into Afghanistan. They don't even ban flights into much of Ukraine. And separatists in Ukraine had just shot down a passenger airliner with a Russian Buk missile. So why exactly was the FAA banning flights into Israel because one rocket had fallen harmlessly a mile away from Ben-Gurion Airport, one of the safest airports in the world? And why was it precisely time to coincide with John Kerry arriving in the Middle East with $47 million for Gaza for Hamas when they were pressuring the Israeli government to stop taking out the missiles and the terror tunnels. I raised those questions, and within hours, the State Department was being asked, did you just launch an economic boycott on the nation of Israel? And then New York former Mayor Michael Bloomberg got on a commercial airliner and flew to Tel Aviv. And within 36 hours, the power of truth and light became too much to bear, and the FAA lifted the ban on flights into the nation of Israel. So that's step one of the strategy, find specific, material, concrete accomplishments that can be done now in a bipartisan way to strengthen our friendship with Israel. The second component of the strategy is a comprehensive strategy of laying out the direction we should be going. And I'll tell you, there is no greater issue right now. There is no greater threat right now to the nation of Israel than the threat that Iran will acquire nuclear weapon capability. We are on the verge, potentially, of an incredibly bad deal. I agree with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who said one year ago that this deal being negotiated by the administration is a very, very bad deal. It is an historic mistake. And in the last year, it's only gotten worse. I was proud to be an original co-sponsor of Kirk Menendez Iran sanctions legislation. For over a year, that legislation has had the votes to pass, but the current Majority Leader, Harry Reid, would not allow a vote on Kirk Menendez. One of the consequences, I am confident, of the new majority in the United States Senate is that early next year we will vote on Iran sanctions. Now, I co-sponsored Kirk Menendez because there's value to having a bipartisan repudiation of this very bad bill. But I'll tell you, Kirk Menendez, in my view, doesn't go nearly far enough. So we introduced our own legislation that would immediately reimpose sanctions on the nation of Iran. that would strengthen those sanctions to make them even more crippling. And that would lay out a clear, simple path. If Iran wants to lift the sanctions, it must disassemble every one of the 19,000 centrifuges. It must hand over every pound of enriched uranium. It must shut down its ICBM program, which exists for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to carry a nuclear weapon either to the United States or to the nation of Israel. And it must stop being the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism.
That's actually a sensible, rational way to deal with radical zealots like the nation of Iran. What are we doing now? Now we are repeating the mistakes of North Korea. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration led the world in relaxing sanctions against North Korea. Billions of dollars flowed into North Korea, and they used that money to build nuclear weapons. The Obama administration has quite literally recruited the very same person, Wendy Sherman, who negotiated the failed North Korea deal to come in and negotiate the failed Iran deal. There is a technical word for this. Lunacy. And I will tell you with Iran, it is qualitatively more dangerous. Because with North Korea, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, they're radical, they're extreme, they're unpredictable, but they're fundamentally megalomaniacal narcissist, father and son. Which means some degree of rational deterrence is possible. When you have Khomeini and the mullahs, who are re religious radicals and extremism, if they ever acquire nuclear weapons, God forbid, in my view, the odds are unacceptably high that they would use those weapons in the skies of Tel Aviv or New York or Los Angeles. When you have religious zealots who glorify death and suicide, ordinary deterrence is not effective. A nuclear weapon over Tel Aviv would murder vast numbers of Palestinians. And yet the odds are far too high that Khomeini would find those perfectly acceptable collateral losses. In the middle of negotiating this deal with our State Department, the leaders of Iran tweeted out a step-by-step -step plan to annihilate the nation of Israel. I agree with Prime Minister Netanyahu that a nuclear Iran presents an existential threat to the nation of Israel. And existential doesn't mean a Frenchman in black chain smoking. It means it goes to the very existence of the nation of Israel. Now, in recent weeks, we were featured with an article quoting anonymous senior officials in this White House describing Prime Minister Netanyahu with an epithet for poultry manure. You know what was startling about that article? Was not the invective, not the disrespect, not the contempt heaped upon the leader of the nation of Israel. Anyone watching the policy of this administration would not be surprised by that. They simply said out loud what the treatment has been. The most disturbing part of that article was another quote from that same senior advisor who said, the best thing of all is we have delayed Israel from acting so that it's too late for them to stop Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon arsenal. This is lunacy. What would real presidential leadership look like? A real president who was standing up for the nation of Israel and for U.S. national security interests would stand up and say on the world stage, under no circumstances will Iran be allowed to acquire nuclear weapon capability. <laughs> Iran will either stop or we will stop them for them. The third component of the tripartite strategy is telling the story. You know, all of us, we are our stories. We are stories as human beings. They are who we are. You know, some people ask, why does this Cuban Texan Republican stand up and fight so relentlessly for the nation of Israel. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> and
and I love you too. You know, part of stories are shared stories, and my story, 57 years ago, my father fled Cuba after being imprisoned and tortured as a teenager. Beaten almost to death, my dad came to the United States at the age of 18, not speaking a word of English, with $100 in his underwear. His first job was washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And he worked full time. He paid his way through school. He went on to start a small business to work towards the American dream. What my dad said to me over and over again when I was a small child is when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? We're fighting a fight here in the United States to preserve our freedom. But the birth of the modern nation of Israel came in the horrible aftermath of the Holocaust when Jews and people of good conscience across the world pledged never again. You know, part of telling the story, I mentioned the three teenagers kidnapped in Israel when they were still kidnapped before we learned they had been murdered. I went to the Senate floor to tell their stories, put up posters of the three teenagers, Naftali, Gilad, Eyal, to tell their stories. These are, you know, Stalin chillingly said, one death is a tragedy, a million a statistic to tell their stories as three teenage boys. One enjoyed playing ping pong, the other liked to cook. To make them real and personal and to say, let these boys go. There's value to telling that story. You know, some months ago I wrote an op-ed entitled A Tale of Two Hospitals. It said you can tell a lot about a society by how it treats its most vulnerable. And a hospital is a nice place to start. And it contrasts a hospital in Gaza, the basement of which is the headquarters for Hamas. They are quite literally using the patients in the hospital as human shields, counting on the humanitarian impulse of the IDF that they will not bomb and attack the headquarters, but hoping that they will so that the useful idiots in the media... Hi, folks. would put the pictures of dead hospital patients on the world news to use it to beat up on the nation of Israel. That hospital, those patients, Palestinians, were literally held hostage guarding Hamas. I contrast that to another hospital, the Ziv Hospital in northern Israel. In May, when I was in northern Israel, right on the Syrian border, I went and visited the Ziv Hospital. The IDF officers there described to me how some months ago, They began having Syrians arriving on the border horribly wounded in that terrible civil war. They debated for a few minutes what to do about it, and they decided the only thing to do is to treat them, provide medical care, and they bring those injured Syrians to the Ziv Hospital just a few miles away from the border. That hospital has treated over 1,000 Syrians. Over $8 million in medical care, all given away for free. And I met with the Israeli physicians and nurses who provide that care. I remember there was a social worker, a young man who was fluent in Arabic. And he said, imagine for a second you're a little Syrian boy or girl. And you go to bed in your bedroom. You go to sleep. And a bomb or a mortar comes through the wall and it explodes and you're horribly wounded. And you wake up. And you find yourself in a hospital in Israel. What this social worker said is these children have been told their entire life that Israel is the devil. 
And this social worker said those kids are typically more terrified of being in an Israeli hospital than they are of the horrible wounds. They may be missing limbs, and yet these little boys and little girls wake up in abject terror, and the social worker calms and soothes the kids. And one of the Israeli physicians told me, a Syrian woman said to her, my entire life, the army that I was told that was there to protect me, now they're trying to kill me. And my entire life, the army that I was told was my enemy and hated me, now are the only people helping me. These are stories that need to be told. These are stories that move people's minds and hearts. You know, the physicians at the Ziv Hospital said if they can change one heart or another or another, that's how you start to undermine the incitement. That's start how you start to change the culture of death. ZOA tells stories all the time. It tells the truth all the time. And there is a need for telling the truth. So I want to close as I opened, simply by saying to each of you, thank you. You know, Professor Dershowitz talked about the event a few months ago in defense of Christians. A lot of people don't know the backstory behind that event. That was an event that was in Washington, D.C., designed to highlight the persecution of Christians in the Middle East. Now, that issue is a deep passion of mine. What is happening to Christians throughout the Middle East is unspeakable. I had been asked to give the keynote address at the main dinner. And the day before the event, the story broke that some of the speakers and funders of the event had significant ties to Hezbollah and had been prominent defenders of Hezbollah. Now, I'll tell you the back story in our office, and Mort's familiar with this story. We spent four or five hours in our office debating what to do, heated, aggressive debates. We canceled almost everything that day to sit and argue about what to do, and most of the staff in the office wanted me to cancel. Just said, don't go to the event, don't go anywhere near it, don't attend. And I thought very hard about it. We listened and argued about it, and I decided at the end of the day that canceling was the wrong thing to do. Number one, the issue matters, the persecution of Christians being carried out by radical Islamic zealots needs far more light and attention shined upon it. But number two, if you cede the debate just to the radicals and the extreme, that does a benefit to no one. And so I resolved that I was going to go. But if I was going to go and stand on that stage with people who may be defenders of Hezbollah, there was going to be not one whit of ambiguity as to where I stood. And so my remarks began that evening. Tonight, we stand united in defense of Christians. Tonight, we stand united in defense of Jews. Tonight, we stand united in defense of people of good conscience who were persecuted and murdered because of their religious faith. I went on to say murder is murder and hate is hate. And Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and Hezbollah and Hamas, and their state sponsors in Syria and Iran are all but different strains of the same cancer that seeks to murder. I observe the undeniable fact that Christians in the Middle East have had no greater friend than the nation of Israel.
In other Middle Eastern nations, Christian populations are dwindling as they are persecuted, murdered, and driven out. In Israel, the Christian population is growing and flourishing. When I observed those facts is when the room began to boo. And it was a room almost exactly the same size. It was about 1,000 people. And the boos began to grow louder and louder. And I'll tell you, in that room, I would say about 40% of the audience was applauding my remarks in, in defense of Israel. But the booers and hecklers were about 20% of the room. It was about 200 people. And the boos grew angrier and angrier. And at that point, I had prepared remarks that evening. I put it aside and simply said, those who hate Israel hate America. I said, those who hate Jews hate Christians. And if you hate the nation of Israel, if you hate the Jewish people, then you are not reflecting the teachings of Christ. The boos at that point grew louder and louder. I will tell you there were in the room people heckling, calling out, not Jews, just Christians, not Jews, just Christians. And at that point, I said, it breaks my heart to see so much hatred expressed in this room tonight. Not everyone here, but a small minority who are expressing those views. And that's when I had no choice but to say, if you will not stand with Israel, if you will not stand with the Jews, then I will not stand with you. You're exceptionally kind. Let me just say thank you, God bless you, and thank you for the honor of joining you tonight. I want to express my profound appreciation to Sheldon and Dr. Miriam Adelson for all that they have done for the ZOA for Christians Unite for Israel, <clears throat> for the state of Israel and the Jewish people at home and around the world. <clears throat> I am deeply humbled by this award and will cherish this moment always because I consider the Adelsons some of the greatest citizens in the United States of America for all the good they do for this nation and the Jewish people around the world. Thank you so much. I would like to express my appreciation to Mort Klein for his tireless work and diligent efforts that have made the ZOA such a vibrant and productive national organization. <clears throat> I would like to give you just a short report on the Night to Honor Israel that began 33 years ago that is now spreading all over the world. A Night to Honor Israel gave birth to Christians United for Israel in 2006. Christians United for Israel is now the largest, strongest, and most effective pro-Israel organization in America with over 1.8 million American families joining. 
And if our numbers continue, by the month of January, we will exceed two million people in this organization. <laughs> Secondly, and very importantly, Christians United for Israel is in the process of formulating new initiatives to increase our presence in Washington, D.C., to have a daily contact with Congress on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people around the world. <laughs> Thirdly, this week British officials came to my home to discuss forming a CUFI to combat anti-Semitism in Europe. <laughs> this spring, Christians United for Israel UK will become a reality because we are in a fight with anti-Semitism around the world and we must win this fight. <laughs> At CUFI, we don't bark, we bite. When elected officials anywhere in America unjustly criticize Israel, we send out a rapid response to our 1.8 million families and they bury those officials in an avalanche of emails and phone calls that are pro-Israel. We gather here tonight fully aware that the next 26 months are going to be very critical in the history of Israel. Israel will gain strength in the fact that there is a new Congress that takes oath in January. But be aware of the fact that the president and his secret letters, as reported to the, by the Wall Street Journal, is anxious to accommodate Iran and their nuclear ambitions. Make no mistake about it that the executive branch of our government, the branch which has the greatest impact on foreign policy is in the hands of one of the most anti-Semitic presidents in the history of the United States of America. I thought it was humorous that the president dedicated the month of May as Jewish American History, Amer Jewish American History Heritage Month. He called it an opportunity to renew our unbreakable bond with the nation of Israel. He knows it's unbreakable because he's been trying to break it for the last five years. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, President Obama's administration launched a disgusting personal attack on Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. A quote, senior Obama administration official was quoted saying of the prime minister, and I quote, the thing about Bibi is he's a chicken explicative, explicative deleted. Those last two words are mine, end quote. The White House said the quote was counterproductive, but made it clear they would make no, no effort to find out who said it. Can you imagine the rage that would be released if some senior official in Washington, D.C. used such language to describe the head of Iran or to describe Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, the weak denunciation by the White House of the verbal attack against the Prime Minister tells us all we need to know. Personally, I call upon the Obama administration to find out who the senior official was that made this anti bb comment and have them removed from public office. This is America. We are not a banana republic. <coughs> the Wall Street Journal reports on October the 2nd that President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu met and clashed over negotiations concerning Iran and its claims to Jerusalem. Quote, the Wall Street Journal, the Obama administration stressed in stern terms that any new Israel construction in East J Jerusalem would cost Israel support of its allies, end of quote. Allies would be America. The fact is Jerusalem has been the capital of Israel for 3,000 years. That's before Washington existed and before Barack Obama was a community organizer in Chicago.
telling the Jewish people what they can or cannot do in Jerusalem, Mr. President, to borrow your own words, is above your pay grade. You really have no authority to tell the Jewish people what they can or cannot do in the state of Israel. Israel is not a vassal state of the United States. They are a free and independent democracy and can do what they please when they please. (laughs) Mr. President, go tell Russia to stop their long range bombers from patrolling the Gulf of Mexico. Go, go tell the Chinese to cy- stop cyber warfare against America and our leading companies. Mr. President, tell the Palestinians to stop deliberately ramming their cars into groups of Jewish pedestrians, killing, killing innocent men and women. <laughs> Mr. President, go tell ISIS that you call the junior varsity to stop the crucifixion of Christians and the senseless slaughter of children. (laughs) Mr. President, go tell Iran to cease and desist from making a nuclear bomb to produce a nuclear holocaust in Israel. Iran must not be allowed to build or buy a nuclear bomb. Do something that really matters besides playing another round of golf after you've heard a journalist has been beheaded. America is looking for leadership and we need it now. Let us all be aware that Israel's fight is our fight, that Israel's enemies are our enemies, that Iran is not our partner for peace, Iran is our enemy. They are not the solution, they are the problem. (laughs) The prophet Isaiah said, for Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet. We have a Bible mandate to speak out in defense of Israel. To quote Eric Bonhoeffer, quote, to see evil and not call it evil is evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. Israel is the land of covenant between God Almighty and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants forever. The covenant is recorded 22 times in the Torah. The controversy of who owns the land of Israel was resolved 4,000 years ago. The Jewish people do not occupy the land, they own the land. Secretary John Kerry, park your State Department jet in the hangar. Your efforts to win a Nobel Prize at Israel's expense has failed. Demanding that Israel make peace with the people who have sworn to wipe them off the map is a delusion that only Washington, D.C. can understand. I propose that America cuts off all foreign aid to the Palestinians until they recognize Israel's right to exist. until they recognize that Israel has the right to defend themselves, that Israel has the right to secure borders and the 1967 borders are not those borders. (laughs) The Palestinians have joined with Hamas, an internationally recognized terrorist group to form a new government. A culture that celebrates the kidnapping and the murder of three Israeli students on their way from home. Murdering them in cold blood is not worthy of statehood. A culture whose leaders call for days of rage must be held responsible for four murdered rabbis who went to prayer meeting and a policeman by two Palestinian terrorists shouting Allah Akbar at a synagogue in Jerusalem this week. This must not go unanswered. These people are not worthy of statehood. (laughs) 
The worse the world gets, the more John Kerry seems to think that pressuring Israel into making a sacrifice for peace will somehow fix everything. Let's look at the record to see the sacrifice that Israel has already made for peace. In 1979, Israel signed a peace treaty with Egypt and withdrew all of its troops and civilians from the Sinai Peninsula, an oil-rich area three times the size of Israel that produced $3 billion a year, a year in oil for Israeli income was given as a sacrifice of peace. What did Israel receive? They received the mockery of Menachem Begin by Enwar Sadat. During the 1990s, under the Oslo Accords, Israel withdrew its troops from every major Palestinian population center in Judea and Samaria. But Israel did not get peace in return. It got the second in Fatada, in which a thousand Israelis were killed by suicide bombers. The ZOA is the only major pro-Israel organization that predicted that the Oslo peace process would not bring peace but further violence. <laughs> While others were ignoring these facts, ZOA President Mark Klein repeatedly reminded Washington and the country that Arafat and the Palestinian Authority were failing to comply with their obligations under the Oslo Accords. In the year 2000, Israel withdrew its troops from the security zone in Lebanon, but Israel did not get peace. In return, they received a rain of rockets. In 2005, Israel withdrew all of its troops from Gaza, and Hamas turned Gaza into a terrorist camp. The truth is, Israel has done more than its share to achieve peace. It's time for the Palestinians to embrace Israel, not Hamas, to embrace peace and not acts of terror, murdering innocent people who go to the synagogue to pray. The truth about the difference between America and Israel is this. Yes, we are both democracies. Yes, Iran is our enemy, not our partner for peace. Iran is not the solution. Again, they are the problem. For too many years, America and Israel have inhabited two completely different worlds. America has lived in a civilized world where eloquent words solve difficult problems. Israelis have lived in a barbaric world where despots and dictators intimidate those with whom they disagree and behead those who continue to talk back. Americans have lived in a polite world where stern criticism of bad behavior can stop marching armies in their tracks. Israelis have lived in a world where the critic ends up hanging from a tree, mutilated. Americans have lived in a world where reason and negotiations bring peace. Israelis have lived in a violent world in which enemies use negotiation as a weapon of war to win advantage for the next conflict. From the comfort and safety of our civilized world, America's leaders are looking down with contempt at embattled Israel. They have lectured Israel like an unruly child. Why are you Israelis always talking about security? Don't you realize that security is no longer of concern now that we have the United Nations, the Tower of Babel in New York, and the international law to protect you? Why are you Israelis always fighting? Why don't you just reason with your enemies? Here's the hard truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Israel has been living in the real world while America's, le while America's leaders are living in a fantasy world. While the Iranians are playing chess, a game they invented, the Americans are playing checkers. Here's the truth about Iran's leaders. During the Iran-Iraq war, and this will help you understand what we're up against. During the Iran-Iraq war, Iran's leaders put a golden plastic key around the necks of their children and ran them across the minefields, blowing their little bodies to bits. The children were told by Iran's spiritual leaders that the golden key was the gates to heaven. Listen, 
over 100,000 Iranian children were slaughtered by their own leaders running across those minefields to save the lives of their soldiers. Their parents complained to the Iranian leaders, not that they were killing their children, but there was not enough left to bury. Thereafter, the children were wrapped in rugs, still slaughtered, but the parents were placated because there was enough to bury. Do you comprehend that? Do you think the American people comprehend that? Do you believe a phone call from the president or a secret letter will change their fanatical minds? These are the people who openly state they intend to destroy Israel and America. Sinus of America, you must understand that Christians and Jews stand together. If a line has to be drawn, draw the line around both Christians and Jews. We are united in this issue. In closing, as we in America confront a more dangerous future, we should not be pressuring Israel to be more like us. We need to be more like Israel. America needs more realism. That was the thing that impressed me the first time I went to Israel the tactless realism of the Jewish people. We need Israel's resolve. We need Israel's will to win. We need Israel's courage under fire. We need Israel's will to defeat dictators. The time has come to stop lecturing Israel. The time has come to listen to Israel. <clears throat> The truth is, Israel isn't the problem. Israel has the solution. When it comes, when it comes to recognizing evil in the world and defe defending us from it, Israel is not the problem. They are the solution. When it comes to providing leadership and direction to a Western world that's lost its way, and ladies and gentlemen, America has lost its way. Israel isn't the problem. Israel has the solution. Like a mantra, John Kerry has the habit of saying, quote, that the Israel-Palestine issue cannot remain unchanged, end quote. Strangely enough, he isn't talking about Syria, where there are over 200,000 people who are dead because they've been slaughtered or gassed to death. He's, he isn't saying this about ISIS, which is crucifying Christians and killing innocent children. He isn't saying that about Iran, about Russia, about China, about Hamas, about Hezbollah. He's only saying that about Israel, the only safe, stable, and democratic society in the Middle East. <laughs> Mr. Carey, it's time to treat Israel as a part of the solution, not the problem, as a friend, not a foe as a democracy, not a tin-horn dictatorship. As Zionist, let us renew our resolve to be more outspoken in Israel's defense. Let us not be intimidated by the opposition. Let us push back and push back fearlessly. Let us choose right over wrong, ethics over convenience, truth over popularity. Let us hold high the torch of truth in a world that does not want to hear the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. May God bless the ZOA, God bless Israel, and God bless the United States of America and each one of you. So I have the great pleasure now of standing with Bernie Marcus, who was the master of ceremonies tonight at the 2014 ZOA Gala. 
He, of course, was long associated with Home Depot, but tonight it wasn't about Home Depot. It was about the Zionist Organization of America. By the way, I thought tonight was very lovely. What about you? I thought it was great, and I, I, I really, putting that many powerful speakers on one dais is amazing. One was more fascinating than the other. They're all compassionate, but all, all, ultimately, they all believe in the same thing. Yes. The fact that Israel has to survive, yes. and that Jews in America and Christians have yes. to support the survival of Israel. And I think that Hagee summed it up, Israel's not the problem. Right. Uh, and, and until our government recognizes the fact that the Muslim world hates us, hates Israel, and hates the United States as well, we're not going to solve that problem. Let's get off the golf course. Let's stop doing fundraisers. Now let's work for peace. And I think that that's a message to the President of the United States. You know, Bernie, one of the things that I thought was so important tonight was that the audience was across the spectrum of the Jewish world. We had left and right up on that dais. No, sir, no, sir. It, wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a polemic, although the reality is most people who spoke agree that they're disappointed in the administration and they believe that America must stand stronger with the state of Israel. I want to know where you stand and whether, in, in essence, what the, the commitment that you saw around, surrounding you tonight reflects who you are as well. The message here tonight is that Israel is fighting for its life and that every American, whether they're Jewish or non-Jewish, has to fight for that as well. And that's my message. That's wonderful. Okay. One last thing. How many times have you been to Israel? Oh, many times. I want you to just talk to the camera. Bernie Marcus, what is it about Israel that somehow excites you and touches your soul? You know, I grew up, I grew up in the depression. I grew up when I couldn't get into school in the United States because I was Jewish. Harvard turned me down because they had a 10% quota on Jewish students. So I want to tell you that the beginning, the state of Israel, when the state of Israel was organized, that was the beginning of freedom in America for Jews as well. And Jews have to understand something. These young kids that go to college, that renounce their Judaism, they don't understand that they are where they are today because of these guys in Europe, in Israel that gave their lives to free them as well. So the state of Israel must be strong because otherwise Jews all over the world will suffer. Bernie Marcus, you're fabulous, by the Thank way. You. And I'm, you know, the way you've cared about Jewish life has been spectacular. One day I want you in the studio just to talk about how you became you and how you feel about Jewish life as a whole. So I'm going to chase you. But I thank you. Wish you kol tuva hatzlacha. And you did a fabulous job tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bernie Marcus. Take care. Look, there are many wonderful people doing wonderful <laughs> things in the Jewish world. But here is an exceptional human being, an exceptional Jew, who, by the way, the things that were said about you from this rostrum today, Mort Klein, they all were true. They all should be said. I was so happy for you. And by the way, is, hasn't this been a thrilling night for you? This is the most thrilling and extraordinary Zero Way dinner we've ever had. The most extraordinary participants among the great leaders of this country, great Zionists in this country, and 1,100 people, including 261 screaming students. What a night. What a night. <laughs> you have seen an arc for the ZOA, and I was talking to somebody who said, you know, it's so true that Mort has built something over the years that is now mushroomed into this exciting, <laughs> uh, electrifying event. And I was wondering <laughs> to myself, what's it mean to you, you know, from behind your own eyes? To see, there have been times when it's been hard to do the ZOA, <laughs> and now you, you're getting a certain kind of recognition, participation, enthusiasm, and it's not just from the right here. You have left and right upon this stage. What's it mean to you? What's it say to you about Jewish life today, Mort? Well, you know, when we started, we were attacked by almost everyone for being extremists. When all we did was tell the truth, when no one else would, about the disastrous mistake of Oslo, about the disastrous mistake of Gaza, and about believing in Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas. We were attacked relentlessly as extremists, as lunatics, as warmongers. Nobody does that anymore. The entire community now understands what a disastrous mistake this was. So, in one sense, it's gratifying that we're no longer condemned. In another sense, it's tragic 
that Israel has come under in increasing danger because of the mistakes of Oslo and the Gaza withdrawal. By the way, <laughs> it's something I should let you speak about for one moment. We're, <laughs> as wonderful as this evening is for you, we are living in very difficult Jewish yes. times. <laughs> and as you look at it, what at the moment gives you the most concern, Mort, for the immediate Jewish future and the future for the state of Israel? The most, uh, this is the most dangerous time for the world and for the Jews since the 30s. And it may even be more dangerous. In the 30s, you had a few Nazi countries. Now you have almost two billion Muslims who hate the West, who hate the Jews, and who hate Christians. The most frightening situation now is the danger of a radical, anti-Semitic, anti-American regime of Iran getting nuclear weapons. And President Obama is acting as if he doesn't care if Iran gets nuclear weapons. He's allowing them to keep centrifuges, keep their uranium, keep their building their ICBMs, whose only purpose is to put nuclear weapons onto them. And so this is really quite a frightening time, and I'm just hoping that the world will start responding. But right now I see silence uh, as opposed to, to a proper response. Okay, mm -hmm. one last question for you. Mm -hmm. It would be inappropriate for me not to give you a chance to also tell us what gives you a sense of confidence mm -hmm. and optimism in the Jewish future. I am confident, first of all, that the polls in Israel show 80% of the Israeli Jews say they are confident and hopeful and thrilled about the future. 80%, it's incredible. I'm also confident that God Almighty in the Torah said we're an eternal people and so we cannot be destroyed or else there is no God and I believe there is. So I, I, I am hopeful there will be miracles, the kinds of which we've experienced throughout thousands of years of Jewish history will happen again. Miracles we cannot begin to foresee that will save the Jewish people and will save the world. I'm confident of that. Kol Tuva Hatzlacha, we've been friends for a while. Yes. It's a real thrill for me to be here tonight and I'm show this to our audience. May you go from strength to strength <laughs> and congratulations <laughs> on a fabulous night for the ZOA. By the way, let me say, DOA has gone from an organization on the verge of bankruptcy yes. with virtually no support yes. to an evening when we have the greatest names from both right and left here at this dinner. Right and, seven, and left. Right, right, and, left, and, right left. and left. We have Mort Zuckerman and Alan Dershowitz and Ted Cruz and Pastor Hagee. And we have seven Jewish billionaires, billionaires in this room supporting ZOA. We had nothing like that 21 years ago when we took I over remember. the ZOA. <laughs> and, you know, without embarrassing you, so much of it is because of your tireless work and the integrity you've brought to this organization. Again, it's been an honor to know you, and I wish you to go strength to strength. You continue the good fight, and you know I'll chase you all the well, time. Thank Lord. you, Rabbi, for your important work of letting the Jewish world know of what's going on in the Jewish world, what's really going on in Israel. You give everyone an opportunity uh, to express their views uh, as opposed to uh, other news stations that only have one point of view allowed. Thank you, Mort. Thank you for believing in, uh, in, in, in the freedom of speech uh, that our Constitution guarantees. Thank you. More inclined.